this way. All right, so our, our last talk on this track uh, for the morning is Seth Bromberger speaking to you about Julia in secure environments. Hi, good morning. Um, so the answer is Julia team, I guess, because uh, I started this um, effort before we even knew much about it. Uh, but uh, we'll have a slide on that at the end. My name is Seth Bromberger. Um, I'm a, a research scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, uh, Lawrence Livermore is one of 17 Department of Energy laboratories, and we focus on uh, all sorts of research from theoretical to applied. My focus is on uh, cybersecurity, specifically cybersecurity of critical infrastructure. That's where I spent most of my career. Um, but today I want to talk to you about some of the challenges that we faced in uh, deploying Julia to sort of unconventional environments. Uh, this uh, does not necessarily have a, uh, uh, this isn't a how-to guide and this doesn't have a really great set of conclusions, but hopefully uh, the experience that I'm about to share will help guide folks who are in similar situations. So um, this really started uh, after a couple of uh, discourse, uh, Julia discourse threads, um, where there was talk about moving things that were normally or traditionally in base and standard library out of base and standard library. Um, and this sounds like a great idea, and everybody's joyful about it. Uh, there was one comment that this will be glorious. Um, it, not so glorious in certain environments, uh, and so this caused a, a little bit of consternation uh, among the folks that, that I work with, um, specifically because we are using Julia, again, in these uh, unconventional environments that uh, don't have the infrastructure support that uh, is presumed in a lot of traditional environments. So what do I mean by that? Um, well, if you, uh, if you look at what a normal environment is versus a secure environment, you might see some of these characteristics. Um, in general, uh, the secure environments in which uh, I work, uh, there is no internet access. Uh, there's very limited ability to install software directly. Um, everything you do is audited. You don't know who's looking at it and when or what's wrong and what's right in some cases. Uh, and so you're really constrained in, in what you do on these systems. Um, and there's a very high ratio of admins to users, which, you know, I guess theoretically sounds like a great idea, but in practice um, sometimes can get in the way. Um, contrast with uh, what we find in um, the real world and in academic environments where things are pretty much open, you can do what you need to do, uh, and uh, you generally have admin privileges or equivalent on your machines. So uh, this is an amalgamation of uh, software request process. This isn't a specific one uh, at, at our lab, uh, but um, it, is, uh, it is pretty representative. Um, and there are, there are eight steps. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see it's, it's fairly complex. Um, and getting media uh, from the internet, from a public GitHub repo to a secure system uh, takes many, many steps. Um, some of these take longer than others. Uh, specifically, uh, step five, wait for approval. Uh, that can take six to eight months. And so uh, there, and, and multiple email threads. Uh, and so you need to really plan ahead. By the time you get your software approved and installed, the new version is already out. And so you've got to start the process again. Uh, especially uh, in Julia pre 1.0, this caused no end of headaches. Um, so it's all fun and games until you run into uh, one of these uh, pitfalls. And that's why I have the uh, snakes and ladders as, as the graphic. Uh, because you're going along, you're going along, you're going along, and all of a sudden there's a problem with your form. Or the admin that's processing it went on vacation for six weeks. Or uh, the DVD that you burned that has the code on it that gets transferred to the, the secure system um, is corrupt for some reason. And then you've got to go back, and you've got to take care of that problem and start the process back there. Um, and so that can add three to six months of delay. And again, in a fast moving environment, uh, you're going to have, at the end of it, you're going to have an, an installation that is now, you know, 
very, very old uh, relative to where you need to be. This is um, specifically a concern if you're doing package development uh, at the same time. So I help maintain light graphs and, and develop light graphs, and so some of the code uh, that is in the master branch, uh, which hasn't been released, um, I want to use uh, when I'm doing my stuff on these on these other systems. Uh, and it's really hard to keep that in sync. Again, uh, it's you know anywhere from six weeks to several months delay uh, in getting that code out. And you can't really bug the admins every week with a new DVD of stuff to load. They, they don't like that either. Uh, so anyway, those are, those are the pitfalls. Um, and I bring this up sort of as a plea uh, to the folks who are developing packages and the folks who are uh, contributing to the, the policy uh, discussion uh, with respect to where the uh, package system goes. Um, moving stuff out of base and standard library, uh, again, is great for uh, increased engagement and fast iteration and everything else. But every time there's a new version, there's a new bunch of paperwork that some of us have to do. So please keep that in mind. If you weren't aware of it already, uh, please keep it in mind when we do have these discussions. Um, one thing that I want to detour to, uh, because it's really important and this, it forms the basis of why we have these policies to begin with, uh, my father once told me that um, the history of a company's mistakes is memorialized in its policy manual. Uh, and so um, the reason we have this policy I think is really good. Um, we see a, a couple of extremes here with batteries included versus no batteries included languages. Um, Node is perhaps uh, uh, the uh, one with the least amount of batteries and they've had some, some very big problems uh, with code dependency and interdependency of libraries. So you may know what your direct dependencies are uh, when you, you know, for your package, but do you know what those are? Do you know what the transitive dependencies are? And all the way down. If you're familiar with the left pad incident with Node a couple of years ago, there was a great example of people relying on code that relied on code that relied on code that all of a sudden disappeared from the web. And so their packages stopped. Um, the, from a security perspective, that's an availability issue, but there's also uh, real security issues with transitive dependencies because you have to audit those and you have to make sure that they're not going to be doing anything or injecting anything into your code uh, that would cause a security problem. And so as we move into this more fragmented, more decentralized package environment, it's something that uh, folks who have responsibility for security and, and maintaining secure environments really need to, to take a look at. And so uh, I used my light grass package, naturally, to look at uh, some statistics. And normally what we do is we look at statistics and we say, okay, my package has four direct dependencies and 20 transitive dependencies, so things that those packages uh, rely on. Um, I reversed it and I said, okay, for all the packages in the general registry, uh, which one, uh, you know, which packages are the ones that other packages most rely on? And here's the top 10. So you can see that the top, the top one, which we'll throw out for a minute because test is really an anomaly. But if you look at random, 74.9% of the packages in the general registry rely on random. Okay, and if I pick the top three, if I pick the set of three packages that give me the most coverage, we're up at something like between 85 and 90%. So if I, as a bad guy, I'm not, but if I were a bad guy, um, and I compromise those three packages, I could compromise up to 90% of the Julie ecosystem. Um, and so that's something that we really need to look at. And so the reason, the reason this is important is because there's an assumption, and I think it's a correct one, that base and standard library get a little more attention than other packages. And so moving stuff out of base and standard library increases the developer uh, engagement and increases the number of folks who are committing to the code and gives faster iteration, which is all great, but it also means that there's a bigger risk that something untoward can happen to that package, and so we really need to keep an eye on that. 
Um, so challenges with Julia, specifically in secure environments, uh, in, in our secure environments, um, the workload isn't distributed. We have, you know, several hundred Python developers, so getting paperwork done on Python is a no-brainer. Someone's going to take it and run with it. Uh, but with Julia, there are only a couple of us. So uh, like graphs required something like 25 forms, uh, and that fell on me to do. Uh, so it's the, the workload for the for the bureaucracy is is not distributed uh, uh, very well um, in in one dot uh, or before one dot we had this movement of functionality out of base we had the a AR pack issue and and some IGs things that required a bunch of resubmission. Um, anything with binary dependencies becomes really, really complicated because you need to figure out what the build.jl does uh, and, and make sure you include the C code or the C++ code in your DVD burn before you move it up. Otherwise, you're going to have a really bad time because you're going to have all your stuff ready, and then when you try to package build, it will fail. Um, and then you can't really share the installation very easily right now. Um, and so everybody's got their own sort of set of uh, packages um, that there are all different versions, and uh, centralizing them is really hard uh, when, when you're doing your own thing. So uh, current options include Julia Pro, uh, copying the packages directly into your, your dev uh, directory. You can share packages from a common depot by, by devving it like this. Uh, package 3 made this really, really easy, um, and so uh, it's, it's really nice to have that. Um, but we're still, we still got this problem with binary dependencies. And then finally, you know, going back to Python. Python is sort of the de facto what our, what our group uses and what the data scientists in my group tend to use right now. I'm trying to convince them to go to Julia, but it's really hard. So uh, it's easier for one person to switch back to Python than have, you know, two dozen switch to Julia um, and run into these issues here. So unfortunately, that's the reality at this point. Um, however, Julia team looks like it might solve a whole bunch of our problems, so we're really looking forward to, to checking it out. Uh, it looks promising. I haven't, looked, I haven't seen it in detail yet. Um, haven't looked at how it uh, handles binary dependencies, but Stefan assures me it does. Uh, and. Uh, the downside is it's going to be a lot of work to get it certified and approved for the system. So I'm looking for someone who wants to go first. So if you're interested, please, please do. Um, final thoughts. Uh, the Julia package dependencies, as I mentioned, are concentrated. Again, the top three represent anywhere between 85 and 90 percent of the ecosystem. Um, there are pros and cons. Uh, the community right now, uh, as we see, especially this week, is small, friendly, and mostly academic, which is awesome. But Julia is going to grow, and it's going to grow outside of academia. It's already growing outside of academia into what are uh, what are now considered sort of non-traditional environments, and we need to keep that in mind as we move forward. Um, the uh, move to industry and government use will, will challenge our current processes, and we need to keep those in mind. And then finally, it's, it's really time to start thinking about security around this code interdependence. We don't want uh, a set of events similar to what happened to the Node ecosystem to happen in Julia. Uh, there is a Slack channel called package-trust. Uh, it hasn't seen much activity, but I'm really hoping as a, maybe as a result of this talk that we'll see more activity in there. And I look forward to, uh, to talking with folks about how best to do this in this great environment. Thank you very much.